Okay, friends, we are starting our live video tonight. Um, it is right now 7.36, so um, thank you guys for joining me. I'm going to wait just a couple of minutes uh, to see who will uh, pop up online. I just want to remind you that I do have access to see comments, so um, I would love for you, if you're watching from wherever you are, just check in. Let me know where you're from. Let me know uh, how you're doing, what the weather is like, where you are. Um, but here in Tulsa, today was a gorgeous day. It was a little humid, a little cloudy but it was warm. It was a nice day outside. So like I said, I'm going to wait just a couple of minutes, but I've got some stories I want to share. Um, I have uh, some recap of scripture. I've got a preview of what we're going to be talking about over the coming weeks uh, at Community Brookside uh, to kind of get you excited about what God is doing. So um, I'm going to hopefully, good evening, Gloria. Glad that you are here. First comment, you win. You definitely win. So um, I would love to just uh, hear what you guys have on your hearts too. So again, this is going to be a conversation, I hope, rather than a monologue from me. I want you guys to join and, and be a part of what uh, this is, whatever this is at this point. This is week three, uh, and hopefully what's going to be an ongoing conversation every Monday evening. So without any further ado, as I see people are popping up on live, I see you. Thank you guys for being here. Please check in. Um, as we're starting this stream up, um, I'm going to start with a word of prayer. So I invite you to just wherever you are, be in an attitude of prayer, whatever that looks like for you. So let's spend a moment uh, in quiet. Let's pray. I invite you to just breathe deeply. That when God created humanity, we were a ball of dirt. God rolled us up into exactly the form that he wanted to make us in and then breathed his ruach, his spirit into us. God, again tonight, breathe your spirit into each of us. Wherever we are, whatever we've been through today, for some of us who are just getting home from a very long day, God, from some of us who may not even have a job that we get up and go to, God, make yourself known. In the midst of a world that is hurting and broken, help us as your church, as people who call ourselves followers of Jesus, help us to be a light in this broken and dark world. God, be with us, your children. Help us, empower us through the gift of your Holy Spirit to be a positive force, bringing about your kingdom here and now. Lord Jesus, we love you and all these things we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. So again, as you are here tonight, um, I just want to remind you that this is a conversation. So I want you to drop comments, questions, prayer concerns, anything you want to celebrate or talk about. Um, I would love for you to drop those things in the comments. And at the end of our conversation tonight, we're going to say a prayer over all of your prayer requests by name individually. So I invite you to participate with that. Um, and then the good news is I will have a record for our church. We can add you to the prayers that we uh, you know do through throughout the week as well. So there you go. Um, I want to recap what happened yesterday. So yesterday um, was our final week in a sermon series called All Things New. And we talked about um, what it looked like to have our life match up with the mission of Jesus' life, right? So we, we talked about what it looked like for us to be uh, good stewards of the life that God has given us. Excuse me. We have, um, we spent most of the morning kind of reminding ourselves that you can't call yourself a Christian and not look like Jesus, because otherwise you should rename yourself hypocrite, right? And, and all of us, let's be clear, all of us at times in our lives have become hypocrites or done hypocritical things, um, but that's not who we want to be, right? Like, so the idea is that we are saved by grace that Jesus offers us, but we live in a response to that grace. Uh, so um, we spent yesterday morning talking about how we live like Jesus so that our lives look like Jesus. And it was a, a fun day and we got to tell some stories. Um, one story I didn't tell was something that happened during the week to me. So um, as you know, last week was pretty gross here in Tulsa. There was ice everywhere. Um, and I, sorry, I just want to, I looked up and I saw my own face here. Um, you can see a bunch of junk in the background. You are uh, in my workshop here at my house. So I've got computer parts and 3D printers and all that kind of fun stuff around behind me. So please, I apologize for the mess, but this is where um, magic happens in the 3D printing world that I live in. So uh, anyway, um, 
but last week, even though the weather was awesome, I got an invite from uh, somebody who comes to our church on a regular basis. So he lives in California, but has a friend who goes to our church. And so he invited me to go to lunch with him on Wednesday of this week. So I went. And by the way, um, it was February 1st. So it was the first time I had eaten lunch in two weeks because I had been fasting for the last two and a half weeks uh, through um, January. And so February 1st, we met for lunch and he, he had some incredible questions for me. He was asking about the differences between United Methodism and other denominations. And as I began to tell him about what makes us special, the, um, you know, the fact that we recognize the three different main types of grace that Wesley talks about, prevenient grace that, um, recognizes that God is calling us even before we recognize that God exists. Um, that God is constantly reaching out to us and he wants to draw us into a relationship with himself. Uh, talking about the justifying grace, that moment where we rec recognize that God is real and that Jesus died to save a sinner just like me, right? That moment when we call ourselves saved is that moment of justification where that we are offered that grace of Jesus Christ freely. And then sanctification, which is a type of grace that is moving us on towards Christian perfection. Now, um, in the United Methodist Church, we believe that um, all people can be perfected in Christian love. Um, it doesn't mean you're a perfect human being in all aspects, but it means you're perfected in Christian love in such a way that your mind gravitates towards the mind of Christ. So you respond to people in love, uh, you have conversations with people in love. Every, every inclination of your heart is towards loving God and loving your neighbor, right? So these types of grace, I'm, you know, I'm telling him all this story. I, I'm talking through the differences between, um, you know, Calvinists who believe in predestination and the free will that the United Methodists preach. Um, and again, if you have any questions, drop those in the comments. Um, anything that you'd like to share with me, again, I want to know. So let's, let's be in conversation. So as, as my friend and I are, are having these conversations in the middle of a restaurant here in Brookside, um, I could see that somebody right behind my friend is like, like looking at us and I can see her talking to who is I'm sure a man that she was in a relationship with right next to her. And, and, and it's clear like through her body language that she was listening to what I was saying. And my wife tells me that I am a loud speaker. I disagree. I think I speak at a perfect level. Um, and I think everybody else is just too quiet. But uh, here we are in this restaurant and we're having a conversation about Jesus that is healthy. We're not debating um, human sexuality. We're not debating um, predestination or, um, you know, human free will. I'm just telling him the differences between denominational breakdowns as best as I can. And again, I don't know all the, the semantics and, and all that behind it. But um, clearly this woman was intrigued. And so, you know, here we are, we have this long conversation. We were there for almost two hours, two and a half hours, maybe. And um, by the time we were done having our conversation, we were wrapping up lunch, our, our waiter, his name was Eli, he dropped off the check and, you know, my friend bought lunch for me, which was very nice. Um, and so this woman goes away, she leaves, and I thought that she had left, um, but she, I'm assuming went to the restroom or something, and then on her way back, she passes her table and comes and stands right next to me. And so I'm looking at her and she says, listen, my name is Sarah and I just need to know where you preach. And I was like, no, hang on. How did you know I preach? Right. And so she clearly was listening to the conversation I was having with my friend and, um, the conversation in that environment kind of gave her this sense of safety. Part of the conversation that we had on Sunday morning uh, in church was that oftentimes we think that people are just going to show up at the church's front door and say, hey, I want to become a member. I, I want to be what you guys are. And the reality is that's not happening. We don't have people knocking down the doors of our churches trying to get in. And it's mostly because we don't do a very good job of being the people that we say we're going to be outside of the church doors. It's just a reality. And it's not that we do it intentionally. It's that's how we end up living our lives. So after a couple of moments of conversation with Sarah, um, she said, you know, my husband and I listened to everything you said, and we were just so intrigued. We just want to know where you preach. So I told her about our church and then we were just a couple blocks away from where we were having lunch. And she said, well, I want to be there. I want to be there on Sunday morning. And I told her, you know, 11 o'clock and, and I was hoping that she would come and, and she didn't come and that's okay right? Um, it's absolutely okay that she didn't come. Maybe she changed her mind. Maybe she was nervous. I don't know. 
Um, but the good news is at least a seed was planted. We were being the people of Jesus outside the walls of the church in a real setting that impacted somebody's life. So I want to remind you and I want to call on you. What are you doing to represent Jesus every single day in the places you find yourself? And that's a rhetorical question, unless you want to drop it in the comments. Um, but all of us should be looking like the savior that we profess everywhere we go. And again, I'm going to be honest with you. I recognize that that's not the case. I mean, I myself, the, the, I am the worst version of me when I'm driving my car. My kids will tell you that. My wife will tell you that. Um, I try not to be angry in a, in a big way. Like I'm not usually, my wife will probably make comments here in a moment about uh, liar, liar, pants on fire. But I, I try not to scream and cuss and yell. I do yell, especially when I'm alone in my car. I don't usually cuss at people. Um, but I do get upset because there's a huge responsibility when you get behind the wheel of a car, like you were supposed to have taken driver's tests and, you know, done follow up and answered questions about what you're supposed to be doing. And oftentimes people drive like crazy and I respond in a way that does not look like Jesus most of the time. So I'm guilty of what I'm asking my own people to do. So friends, let me tell you a story, um, and you may not know this, but pastors are not perfect, right? I am a normal human being and I make mistakes every single day that I live and I try to do better every single day. And oftentimes I fail. And we as pastors also recognize that about you. So hear me when I say this. If you come to my church, it is not, it is not going to be a moment where I get to say, mm, girl, you are not living your best life, right? Like, oh, I recognize that you blah, 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 fill in the blank. That's, that's not my job as a pastor. My job is to tell you who Jesus is and to point you in his direction. My hope is that as a pastor of a church who loves you and tries to exemplify Christ, that you will have a relationship of your own with our Savior. That's, that's the goal of what being a pastor looks like. I also try to be a good person every single day I live and oftentimes I fail. But know that because I fail, I recognize the frailty of human will. I recognize that we all make mistakes. I recognize from a firsthand perspective that no one is perfect, even though um, we believe that love can perfect us. So, oh good, hey, hi Kira. <laughs> Uh, finally got on in time to watch it live. Hello. I'm glad that you're here. Um, so, so here's the deal, friends. We have got to be better at being the church of Jesus, right? So we, we recognize right now that, and again, I'm going to bring it up. It's just something that's hot on the presses and, and everybody's talking about it, that the United Methodist Church is splitting over human sexuality. I promise you that people aren't necessarily not showing up to our churches because we're having a discussion about human sexuality. Friends, people are giving up on our churches because we say we love Jesus, but then we don't look at all like Jesus. Right? I want to read a scripture to you, and this came from my sermon this week. It comes from Matthew chapter 5. And if you know anything about Matthew, you know that this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Right? So we have the, the beginning here. Jesus is, is standing up on a mountainside. He goes up there and he sits down and he calls his disciples and the people that are around him and he begins to teach begins to teach them right and he you know blessed are the meek blessed are the poor blessed are the the merciful like all all these different the beatitudes is what they're called right but here's what I want to draw your attention to Jesus says in verse 13 you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. So it doesn't say do your best so that people can pat you on the back and, you know, say, hey, great job. You're, you know, yay you. 
It says do your best so that people can see God in action through the way you live your life. And I think that too often we forget that being a disciple of Jesus, being a follower of Jesus, being a Christian, when we take on the name Christian, it literally means like Christ. I promise you, Jesus doesn't look like my anger when I'm driving down Peoria in traffic, right? We've got to be better, church. And it's not just people who show up on church or show up at church on Sunday mornings. I'm talking to anybody who calls yourself a Christian or a follower of Jesus. We are called to be better at being the hands and feet of Jesus at work in the world around us right this second. And again, it's not the debate about human sexuality that's causing people to stay outside our doors. It's the fact that we set a terrible example of what the church should look like, right? When the church, in, in the book of Acts chapter 2, later on in the chapter, there's this beautiful vision of what church looks like. There's, you know, all these people are gathering together and whatever they have, they sell so that it can be used for the greater good of all the people in the community. If there's anybody without anything, they take from that pot of money and they make sure that people have enough. Everybody gave some things so that everybody could have something, right? That was the church in the first century. And it says that God was adding to their number every single day, those who were being saved because the church at that point looked like Jesus. It was meeting the needs of the people and they taught each other. They sang hymns together. They worshiped together. It looked like the body of Jesus at work in the world around them. It's been a long time since I think we've done well at looking like that, right? So I'm going to ask you guys in your comments, I want, I want to know what are some of your thoughts on how we can be better at being the church of Jesus? What are some little things that each of us could do every single day to exemplify Jesus, okay? So do that for me. I just saw a comment pop up and then it disappeared. So I don't know what happened. Uh, but but welcome. I, I really want to be in conversation, okay? Um, so another cool thing that happened yesterday is we had a family join our church, right? So they had been members of a, a, a different church. And as the split was approaching, they they felt like Community Brookside was their home. And so I got to baptize their daughter yesterday it was a sweet day. Um, go back and watch the video at the end of me baptizing her. And, and again, the the book of worship says that we should apply water liberally, right? Like, and when we're, we're baptizing a child, like we should not be, um, it's not a moment to be conservative in our, in our use of water. And so as I'm scooping water out of the, the basin and I'm, you know, putting on her head and I'm blessing her in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, at the end of that, we pray over her. And then she says, uh, he got me wet. Like it was, it was this beautiful, like sweet moment. Um, and, and this is why it's important for us to do confirmation, right? Like I, I don't remember my baptism. I was little when I was baptized. I, I, and again, I, I may be mixing my memories here, but I, I remember being little and I was at St. Mark's United Methodist Church here in Tulsa and I was in the nursery and my parents called me out of the nursery to go into the worship service so I could be baptized. And I remember coming back to the nursery and I thought I had what was a yellow um, sweatshirt and I remember seeing water on it. And again, I might be conflating memories together and maybe I spilled juice on my shirt. I don't know. Uh, but I don't remember my actual baptism. I don't remember anything about it. But I do remember my confirmation class, right? Where I decided when I was in the sixth grade, I believe, fifth or sixth grade, um, that Jesus was enough for me. Like I, I wanted to confess that Jesus who gave his whole life to make sure that I could be saved from my stupidity, my own self. Um, yeah, I'm in, you know, I, I make enough mistakes that if Jesus says that I can be healed and free of that, yeah, I'm in, I'm in all in. So, um, you know, I remember confirming my baptism when I was a teenager, a young teenager. Um, and so this is why it's important because, um, Sophia is not going to remember me maybe when she's 13 or 14 or 15. I, I hope she does. I hope she's still actively involved at what we're doing at Community Brookside. Um, and she won't remember, uh, you know, saying, gosh, mom, he just, he soaked me. Um, but I hope what she does remember is that there was a community of believers around her that promised to help raise her in a way that helps her to follow her faith journey. That's the importance of baptism when you're a young person. It's 
it's your parents standing up and saying, I recognize that God is already at work in your life. And I baptize you in the name of Jesus. And you'll need to someday confirm that in your own life. Like, yes, you accept that baptism as your own. Um, but it was just, a, it was a beautiful day yesterday. We had a, a, a big full church. Uh, worship was great. It was just an honor to be there with the Barn, Barnes family. And it was awesome. Um, it was just a great day. And um, I, I look forward to what God is doing in our community. It looks like, you know, more and more people are finding us, more and more folks are joining us. And, and I just, no matter what the church faces, I fully believe that if we're following the will of God, God is going to take care of all the little details that we get wrapped up in. So anyway, I'm, I'm just excited to see what God is continuing to do. Uh, at Community Brookside, and I hope you are too. Let's see here. Gloria says this, could we join with another UMC church to support their weekly or monthly mission to help those at risk? That's beautiful. Possibly near us or downtown. As our ministers say, our routine habits reflect who we are, but not in my car too. Okay. So thank you, Gloria. Uh, Praise the Lord. We need to work on that. And maybe you on Sunday morning asked me how I was driving this week and maybe I'll ask you the same. Okay. But I think that's going to be the only way we can get better is if we have people holding us accountable. Um, I love that idea, Gloria. Um, So there are places like, you know, again, we partner with Restore Hope um, because we have this incredible asset with Jeff Janes, who is not technically a member of Community Brookside. He's a member of the Oklahoma Annual Conference as an uh, appointed United Methodist pastor. He can't be a member of a church like I can't be a member of a church either. Um, But we do have the the blessing of his presence a vast majority of the weeks of the year because Community Brookside is his church home. Uh, So he is the executive director of Restore Hope. For those of you who don't know this, he is just one of the greatest men I've ever known. Um, Just an incredibly gifted Wesley scholar. He is a doctor and buff. He is a United Methodist nerd like me, but to the nth degree. Um, And he takes care of people in need, right? God has called him to not just be a pastor, but he is a pastor appointed to what's called an extension ministry in the United Methodist Church. And that extension ministry does the work of Jesus through missions outside of a what's considered a classical church building. So the ministry that Jeff does, um, it both helps them spiritually. They do have a chapel there at Restore Hope, um, but that also gives them dignity. They have um, the ability to go through a a food pantry and collect food that they want to eat rather than stuff that's just given to them in a brown bag. Here you go. Here's what we have today. They get to go and choose what they get to eat, right? And that's a distinctive ministry that um, our United Methodist Church does through Restore Hope that's valuable. And it brings people like a sense of self-worth that oftentimes you don't get when you show up to a place where you're hoping to get a handout. So we are blessed to have him as a part of our congregation. We are already partner with them. Uh, so we do some things when they need help. We are one of the first places that Jeff calls um, and we try to get response happening as quickly as we can. It's not um, it's not like a monthly thing, but I'm, I'm open to other suggestions of other places we can partner with. Um, when I was young, one of the best ministries that I was a part of was I went down um, every fifth Sunday. And I know that sounds really weird, but it was like any, um, any month that had five Sundays, our youth group would go and feed the homeless at the Salvation Army um, feeding location. And, and I think all that's changed since I was in high school, but um, the Salvation Army did a feeding program and we would go and we would get there at like four o'clock in the morning and we would set up and we would serve meals and we would just tell people that we love them. We'd spend time with them downtown. Um, and it's, it was always the, the most broken people who just needed to fill their bellies because they didn't know where any other meal was going to come from that day. Um, and to me, I always loved it. I always stayed in the back and washed the dishes and I got to bless people as they were walking out the door. Um, I was one of the last voices that they heard telling them that we're praying for them, that we care for them, and telling them to, no matter what, have a good day, right? Uh, so I I want something like that to happen. Um, I would be absolutely okay with us partnering with other churches, uh, especially other United Methodist churches. I think that's the benefit of having a connected denomination, finding ways that we can partner with other folks that do great ministry. So Gloria, if you have any specific ideas, I would love um, more specifics on that. Um, and you know where to find me. So there you go. Kira says love network. Yeah, girl. 
Um, so when we were at Heritage, um, we started a ministry called Love Network where we baked cookies. So our youth group, um, when we did a, a youth room remodel, we intentionally built a kitchenette in there with an actual stove, a full-size refrigerator, a kitchen sink with a garbage disposal so that we could um, make and serve cookies for our neighbors. And so we'd make probably... 46 to 50 dozen cookies. Maybe that's too much. I don't remember. But we made a ton of cookies. And the kids would all help make them. They would all wash their hands. We'd all get together. We'd pray over the cookies. We would wrap them up. We'd bake them together. And then we would wrap them up. And we would take them out that same day. And we would distribute them. We would just go house to house. And we would knock on the door and just say, hey, we made you these cookies. We just were your neighbors from the church down the street. We just want you to know that we're here for you. Do you have anything that we can pray for you about? Any issues in your life that we can be in prayer about? Um, and that was it. Other than just asking for prayer requests, it's not like I don't want your money. I don't want your personal details. I don't, I'm, this is not even an intentional invite to the church. It's letting you know that we're here if and when you need us. So um, it was so funny that you mentioned that because I, I was thinking about that about a week and a half ago as a way for us to remind our neighbors that even though we're in a building where we're upstairs above a sushi restaurant in a nail salon, um, that we do love them and care for them. So um, I think that's what it's been called. It's been a while. Yes, it has been a while, but also donations for those in need with pre-made bags from donations as well as connecting and prayer requests. So all of that, yes. Um, one of the issues that I see outside of our doors in Brookside is that we have this weird transient population that comes to the quick trips and, and we're at this weird spot between I-44 and downtown. And so people will, they will come to Tulsa and that a lot of times if you're getting a ride to Tulsa, you get to a gas station from, you know, Oklahoma City or Muskogee or Bartlesville, wherever you're coming from. Um, and you get to whatever the nearest gas station is if you're hitching a ride and you get dropped off there and you're kind of left to your own devices. Well, what happens in Brookside is that people are dropped off around that I-44 overpass where it passes over Peoria and there's a quick trip right there. And so there's always people who are in need asking for money, asking for food right outside of that quick trip. Um, and as they're made aware of the resources that Tulsa has to offer, they make their way past our church, which is right down Peoria on their way to downtown. And there's a bus rapid transit system that gets people from all the way out to like 121st South Tulsa to up to 36th Street North along Peoria. So um, it's it's this really weird corridor where there just happens to be a lot of homelessness. And I found people, and it's just heartbreaking, and I, I've gotten to know a lot of our homeless folks. Um, there was a person who had set up a tent kind of in between. We have a, a storage container, and then we have a little tiny house um, that was going to be my office because we didn't have a church space. Um, but he had set up a tent between those two spaces and was using our grill to cook hot dogs. And the hardest part of being a pastor is looking at somebody and saying, I know you need this, but you can't stay here, right? It is, it's a safety concern. It's a safety issue because as I walked up to his tent and he had, you know, stuff everywhere, his drugs were literally sitting in front of me. There was a pipe and I don't know if it was marijuana or crack or, you know, whatever. Um, but it was definitely a, a drug paraphernalia kind of pile in front of him. And uh, I said, listen, you can't stay here, but how can I help you? And so I brought him back some Gatorade and some socks, right? That's what he needed. And that's the only need that I could meet. I can't give you a place to stay. I don't have any cash. Our church is not at the place yet where we can just give cash away to help people. We've done some very specialized things where we have met the needs through giving like checks or specific gift cards for specific items. Um, but we, we are just not sustainable yet. And so once we're able to sustain ourselves financially, I cannot wait for us to do the mission of the church. And again, it's the mission of the church is not to sustain buildings or put in stained glass windows. The mission of the church is like it was in Acts to take care of the people right outside of our doors who need to know Jesus and just need a little hand up, right? Um, so all of those things are good. We we don't necessarily keep those things on hand to hand out. And we've talked about it. Erica is my assistant. She and I have talked about um, what it would look like for us to have some bags on hand with like some basic hygiene items for uh, our homeless friends. Um, but the, the issue is, 
I don't know that many folks would really take advantage of them. A lot of that stuff I'm sure would get thrown out. We would need to be very specific on what we could include in those bags. Um, and it just, it involves us being more intentional as pastors and, and, you know, the volunteers in our church to figure out what that is. So I'm going to take responsibility for that. If we want to get to that point, then it's going to be us doing a little research on what we can do to actually make that happen. So thank you, Kira. That is very, very good. Jody says, yes, love God, love people, period. Yes, agreed. The end. Our opinions of current angsty political divisions do not matter at all. Lots of periods there, and I fully agree. So let me just tell you a story about my church. We have intentionally set up our church to be a place of the wide center, right? I don't care where you are politically. Actually, you can keep that to yourself. I don't need to know. I don't want you to know my politics. I want Jesus to be the basis of all of my politics, right? So if you recognize any political person or party or moment that doesn't look like Jesus, I'm not for it, okay? Period. I don't care. Republican, Democrat, Independent, Green Party, Tea Party, whatever. If you don't look like Jesus, I am not for you. And so that means I'm usually not for much government work, right? Um, and that's what's great about being a pastor is that my concern is that my loyalty is not with any of the kingdoms here on earth. It's to the kingdom of God, which I'm trying to build right here, right now, right? And what's great about Community Brookside is that we have people who are adamantly opposed to each other's political parties. And yet we've still created a community where both feel welcomed and loved and valued. Because we listen to each other. We talk to each other. We don't talk about each other. We don't spend a lot of time on any sort of political issues. Now, let me be clear. Like the gospel of Jesus is socially radical. It's radical. Anybody who says that Jesus wasn't political, you, you're wrong because Jesus spoke specifically against those who held power. Sometimes it was against the Roman Empire. Sometimes it was against the religious leaders. Sometimes it was against um, centurions. Sometimes it was against the Pharisees or the Sadducees. Sadducees. Sometimes he even spoke to his own disciples in condescending ways because they didn't quite get it. The things that Jesus said were radical and politically charged. And we as the church, although we are supposed to maintain this apolitical stance, and, and I absolutely do that at Community Brookside, social issues kind of have a political connotation and the church has to be involved in the society that we find ourselves in. We have to speak to homelessness. That is a political issue. We have to speak about mental health. That is a political issue. It is also a, a gospel issue. All of those things are real and valuable and we have to talk about those things. So we have created a church that is a church of the wide middle where hopefully, no matter what your political beliefs are, you can find yourself a safe place at our church. So I agree. It's our political divisions do not matter in the church. You're 100% right. What does matter is that our allegiance is to the kingdom of God first and everything else second. Jody says, I-35 and I-44 are also known human trafficking corridors. Yes, they are. Connecting people with resources before their vulnerability is exploited is crucial. Calling 211 is a good first step. So friends, that is great advice. If you need to put that in your cell phones, do that. 211 is an incredible um, resource for you. I, I have never had to call 211, but I have known uh, for sure that human trafficking. Um, what is Oklahoma City is, what do they call it? It's like the, the junction of the country. There's so many different highways that converge right at Oklahoma City. Um, and I-35 is for sure one of them, 44 um, 77, I think also rolls through there. Um, I don't know, but yeah, if there's just a lot of bad things that happen in our world and it's awful and we need to be able to be the crossroads. Thank you. That's it. Yes. Um, she, Kira says totally off topic. Do you have a nursery or kids area? Yes, we do. We just hired uh, a new children's director and she is fantastic. Her name is Amanda and I cannot, God, she has gotten everything so beautifully organized in our children's area. Um, we had a previous children's minister who was wonderful. Her name was Emily, and I cannot tell you enough good about her. She was um, just an incredible young woman and just loved kids and was so good with them. Uh, but during COVID, she ended up getting, before COVID, she got a full-time job working at um, the Little Lighthouse, which is absolutely her calling. So she works with special needs students especially, and she is just 
I, oh, I love her to death. Um, anyway, she um, had our children's area rocking and rolling. She had like years worth of curriculum printed and created and just loved our kids, knew them all, was encouraging volunteers and getting young people involved in working in the nursery. Uh, and then when COVID hit, she resigned because she didn't want to take COVID from the church to uh, her special needs students at her school. So um, it was a tremendous loss for us. But, um, you know, and we've been without a children's minister for the last two years. And so um, God bless Erica, uh, because I tasked her with like coming up with a weekly activity for our students and like a little book for any young people that could come into um, our, our worship service and they would have something to color on and pay attention to. Um, and then she excuse me, she was also in charge of making sure we had volunteers to staff our nursery for like the littlest of kids. Um, and so we, um, praise God, now have somebody who um, is working to really have a program corresponding to what's happening in what she calls big people worship. And I love it. It's really sweet. So yes, we do have a nursery and we do have a children's ministry. We have a Sunday school class uh, for young people. I know right now, um, we don't have a good 10 o'clock hour for young kids, um, but we do have a good 10 o'clock hour for our youth group. We do have a small youth group. We do have adult Sunday school classes, and then we have worship starting at 11. So yes, <laughs> Gloria says, we all need an Erica. Girl, if I could have two Ericas, that might that might get me where I need to be because I need all the organization, and she's got that. So um, today we were doing some brainstorming. So just, you know, I love this conversation. If there's anything else you guys want to share, or any other concerns or questions you have, this is your time. Please um, jump in and, and, and talk about it. But I'm excited because over the next few weeks, we're going to change our sermon series. And the title of it, I believe, is For Such a Time as This, right? And we're going to be focused on the story of Esther. And if you, gosh, over the last four weeks, I've read that story probably 15 times, just over and over and over again, to really get what God has for me um, as we preach through the sermon series. And then oftentimes when I'm working through a sermon series, I have kind of a preconceived notion of where I want to go and what direction I want to take. And it's just been clear to me, like the more I read this story, there's just so much gold in it. Um, you know, for a book that doesn't talk about Jesus, it doesn't even mention God one time. There are some pretty big themes that make a difference in our lives right now. Like the things that are in the book of Esther are some things that we really need to hear about again. Um, you know, what it looks like for us to have incredible pride in who we are, like Ouch, there's some pretty big lessons to learn there. Um, the importance of beauty, both inside and out. Um, you know, we're, and it was wonderful because today, Erica and I have created enough margin now that we have Rich on staff, who is just a, a godsend. We have Amanda on staff, who's an answer to prayer. So now Erica and I, as she's still dealing with like paying the bills and making sure we have rent checks in on time and sending our money to the district and putting everything in the bank and all the admin stuff that she has to do. I, that's not where she excels. She really excels in brainstorming um, sermon series and brainstorming like big events. And so today we got some time to just kind of talk through Esther and she's going to go home and read it tonight again. And she's read it a million times and uh, seen the the movie, um, and I don't remember what it was called, but The King's, I, I don't know. There's a movie about the Book of Esther, and I guess it's pretty good. I've never seen it. But um, we got some time to brainstorm today, and she was just really helpful in kind of thinking through, like, all right, Matt, really, you're going to have to narrow it down because you've got 37 weeks of material here, and ain't nobody going to sit through that. So I, I agree with her. Um also, I've become long-winded anyway, so um, I, I need another Erica to do the admin stuff and to do the uh, all the other things. Um, she's Esther wants to glean from life what the world leaves in their wake. Uh, yeah, that's that's wise. That's wise. Um, what other things you have for me? So again, I'm I'm kind of telling you a little bit about you know what's coming up in the next few weeks when it comes to sermon series. Um, my hope is that we'll have more folks joining the church. Um, here's what I want to say. In a time when church membership is declining, and again, if you look at any of the polls, uh, if you look at any of the reporting that's been done by some of these major networks, um, oh, Gallup polls specifically, um, Barna does good research on Christianity in America, Every single one of these polls will tell you that Christianity is shrinking. 
Fewer and fewer people are getting up and making a dedicated effort to go to church every week. Um, last I heard, and this is a, a pretty old statistic, you can call yourself a dedicated Christian going to church one time a month. So that means you can call yourself a dedicated Christian, a committed Christian, and go to church 12 times a year. I, listen, can you do anything well doing it 12 times a year? Like, if you were going to be training for a triathlon, and you're like, ah, I'll run it in December, and you start January 1, and you're like, okay, I'm going to run one time a month, and then in January or December, I'll be ready, right? You have 12 months of practice and preparation, and you say, one day, and then that one day is, I'll be there for one hour, I'll, I'll run for one hour, one day a week. You would not be equipped to be able to run a marathon or a triathlon or whatever I said at the beginning of this illustration. Um, you wouldn't be able to do that well, right? <clears throat> We're talking about the way we live our lives every single day mattering. And if you train yourself to live like Jesus one day a month, 12 times a year, that's all you get. Can you really know Jesus that well? And again, I, I, let me be clear when I say this. I don't think all religious learning comes in the church. I think Christian community is beautiful. Outside of the church is wonderful. I think spending time in Bible study, in, um, in, in, in doing, um, oh gosh, what's the word? Praying and um, you know, fasting and reading scripture and all those things. Um, spiritual disciplines, when you're doing all the spiritual disciplines, sorry, lost words, um, when you're doing those things on your own, that is absolutely valuable. Um, but friends, it, I don't think we can come up with a solid theology on our own, not going to church, not hearing pastors or Sunday school teachers, or even being in religious conversation with friends that you trust and rely on uh, to help guide your theology. You're, you're asking for a world of hurt. You're asking for a world to hurt. So um, in a world where religion is shrinking, I am excited that last year, I think it was like um, Community Brookside saw 111% growth. Now again, we're tiny. We're a very small church. But the number of people, our average attendance was up by 111%. And there are not very many churches in our denomination, in our conference that can say that. Now I can only compare it to or United Methodist Brothers and Sisters, because that's some statistics that I can actually look up. Um, but in a world where religion is shrinking, our church is growing. And I think it's because we're offering something that seeks to honor Jesus more than anything else. Dan says the growth is awesome. And Dan is a part of that growth. In 2022, Dan joined in July um, and his wife is our children's minister. And I, I'm thankful for him bringing their kids to our youth programming and their their boys are being active and they're getting involved in volunteering at the church. Last week, uh, their their older boy Isaac ran the lyrics for our uh, our worship. When I'm, you know, preaching and he would run like all the slides that show up with the scriptures on them. Um, I, I'm just very proud that Dan and his wife and his kids are plugging in um, you know, Dan has adult children too. Um, his son Daniel was there last week and brought his grandbaby. Like it, I am so excited to see young families and new families getting involved. It's, it just, it's beautiful. And when we look like the people we say we're supposed to be, I think that growth is going to come naturally. When we look like a church that honors Jesus and not a political party, not an agenda, if our agenda is Christ, that's that's all we need, right? Uh, what are we going here? Being together in worship and mission is invaluable, Gloria says. I agree with you 100%. Um, mission work is great to do on your own, but guys, we grow exponentially when we do it with our brothers and sisters. It's It changes us. It doesn't just change the lives of the people that we impact. It changes us. Uh, Dan says, I make them help me with the trash can too. That's right. So Dan uh, and his boys have taken up the responsibility to kind of help clean up our park. We have a corner at um, 37th place. Yeah, 37th place right on Peoria that there was this terrible vine that was growing up this um, light pole there, the power pole, and it was blocking the view of traffic. They cut all of that out. They dumped out the trash can. They have decided, you know, they want to make that 
the Arthur family trash can. And I, I just named it that. That's definitely, I'm not putting your name on a trash can, Dan. Um, but they have claimed that and they said, we want to serve the church in this way. And guys, it's those little things that are beautiful to me as a pastor, because let me tell you, oftentimes it's, it's me that goes to dump out the trash. Today, Erica and I, as we're brainstorming and we're talking about, you know, the plans and the hopes and the dreams for our congregation, we were um, wiping down and sweeping out the elevator. I don't know if you've been in there recently, but it's pretty gross. Like, it doesn't smell the best. Um, it gets the job done, but, you know, we cleaned off all the glass. We cleaned off all the stainless steel. We cleaned off our front door. Um we have to do that. And when church members and participants in our church say, you know what, Matt, I'll take that on. Praise Jesus. Because that just, that makes a pastor's heart just skip a beat. It's wonderful. Peter says, hi, Matthew. Hello, Peter. It's good to see you, buddy. I haven't seen you in a long, long time. Bless you, my friend. Um, yeah, so I, I am wrapped up with anything that I had on my heart today. I talked a lot about um, what it looks like for us to align our faith with who we say Jesus is. Like, we need to look like him. I talked about my encounter with a young woman who saw us, like, an immediate reaction to when people see us out in the world living like Jesus, talking about Jesus in a way that's not condescending or hurtful, and it's loving and edifying and builds community. People respond well to that. And then I kind of gave you a little bit of a preview about what's going to happen um, in the coming weeks at church at Community Brookside with my new sermon series. I'm getting text messages from my daughter who is here in my house. So, um, anyway, so I'm, I'm getting some things that, there you go. Okay. Um, but my sermon series coming up uh, for such a time as this, talking about Esther. I hope that you guys will uh, make an effort to be there if and when you can on Sunday mornings. Let's do better than once a month, friends. Let's do better than once a month. Let's be fully committed followers of Jesus. Not, eh, when it feels good, I'll go kind of committed followers of Jesus because we can come up with any excuse we want to to not be at church, right? It's easy. Um, Gloria says, prayers and thank you. Yes. Okay. So let's make some prayers. I just got a text message prayer request from a friend of mine that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but it, thank you. If you have my cell phone, you can text me those things too. Um, but I, I want you guys to know that this is an opportunity for us to be in prayer with and for one another. And guys, I believe that God answers prayer. I've seen it happen. I've seen God do some pretty amazing miracles. Um, I believe in the power of prayer. So if you have anything you'd like to pray for, now is the time. Drop those in comments. Send me a text message. Um, because friends, I, I let's let's be a people of prayer. That's what God calls us to. So um, I'm wrapping it up. You've got exactly 14 seconds to uh, send me any prayer requests that you might have. And I would like for us to close out in prayer. So drop them in the comments. If you have anything, do it. What do we got? Kira says, I will, if I can find a ride, what time does service start? Service starts at 11. You can message me anytime you want, Kira, absolutely. Silly question, what time does service start? 11 o'clock, love it. Same question, same answer. Um, if you need to know more about us, I'll post um, a link to our website. It has a little bit of a promo video about who we are. We're seeking to be a, a congregation that looks like Jesus, that serves some of the, the most left behind that the church sometimes has neglected and forgotten. Um, that's, that's who we want to be as a church. So watch that video. If you have questions, send me an email. If you've got my phone number, text me. Um, I'm not going to advertise my phone number online. That's silly. But if you know me well enough that you have my phone number, please text me and let me know. Um, you can always message me on Facebook, uh, message the church. Those emails or in text messages come from the church to me or Erica. We see every single one of them. And I promise you I'll respond. I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so service starts at 11 and, um, I hope if you don't have a church home or if you have a church that is leaving you behind, maybe a church that's, um, seeking to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church and you want to remain a part of uh, a wide middle, then community, right? Community Brookside might be a place for you. So we're at, um, 38th and Peoria. Um, and again, I'll drop that here in the, the comments after we're done. Dan says, we need to do more. I have a family that's coming simply because we're not judgmental. Hang in there, Matt. Love you, Dan. Man, I, I value people just starting there. Just start with not being judgmental, right? 
That's the least we can do as the hands and feet of Jesus. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. I've given you more than 14 seconds and I haven't seen any major prayer requests, but I am going to pray for this one that I've received um, the best I can without giving away too much information. But if you would, let's take a second and pray together. Don't, don't log off here in this moment. It's an opportunity for you to jump away, and I understand that, but be in prayer with us together. So I invite you to just be comfortable in this moment and just spend your time breathing and hear these words. Gracious God, you have called us to be your church, and God, the church is way more than a building. The church is supposed to be made up of people who look like you, who love you, and who are your hands and feet. God, in the moments that we fail, help us to be better. God, call people into our lives who will hold us accountable and and help us to listen carefully with an open mind when we're called out in those moments where we drive like crazy people. God, I'm so thankful for the work that you've called me to. I'm thankful for all these incredible people who've been a part of my conversation tonight. God, I pray for blessings on them and their families. But God, right now I specifically lift up this situation that was texted to me. God, you know what's going on there and you know what's best. God, and we pray for simply that, your best, not ours. God, I thank you so much for these incredible folks that you have blessed me with. Every one of these folks, God, has helped me become the man that I am today. Lord Jesus, help me to be the pastor you've called me to be. Help me be the friend you've called me to be. Help me to be the husband that you called me to be. God, we love you, and we want to be your people. Empower us through the gift of your Holy Spirit to be those people who look like the hands and feet of Jesus everywhere we are. Because God, we have a world that's hurting and broken and they don't need more Matt Morgans. They need more Jesus. So help us to give them all that your Holy Spirit promises. God, we love you and we bless you tonight. And all these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for spending your evening with me. Um, I am so thankful for you, and and I hope that these times are valuable for you. Um, If you ever have any questions or anything you need, please let me know. Um, Like I said, I'm going to leave a link to our website here in the comments. You can search through our Facebook page um, at Community Brookside. Um, It's Facebook Community Brookside. Uh, You can find all of our previous sermons. You can find um, any sort of resources that you need to get a hold of me. But friends, I invite you to be a holy community with one another and with me. So continue showing up on Monday nights, hopefully at 7, unless things kind of throw off our schedule. But thank you guys for pushing back a half an hour and waiting on me. I'm so blessed. You guys, I hope you were blessed tonight. Go forth from this time being held in the very presence of our God May you go with the power of the Holy Spirit. May you go with the wind at your back and the sun on your face. Friends, let's be the hands and feet of Jesus at work in the world around us this week. So go now. Love you guys. Have a great week. And we will see you hopefully Wednesday night for youth, Sunday morning for church and Sunday school, and back here again on Monday night. Love you guys. We'll catch you soon. Have a good one.